Welcome to the Pursuit Zone Adventure Travel Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Schmid, and I interview modern-day explorers from around the globe to bring you their exciting stories. These are people that dream big, get out of their comfort zones, and accomplish ambitious pursuits. This is episode 147 with Larry Mishkar. I met Larry at the Outdoor Adventure Expo put on by Midwest Mountaineering. The first half of this interview is mainly the nuts and bolts of the trip. And in the second half, Larry talks about how the adventure changed him personally, how he quit his job after this adventure and changed his lifestyle so he could have more adventure in his life. But before we get to that, if you want to give me some feedback about the show, you can reach me at paul at thepursuitzone.com. And you can also leave me a voice message through SpeakPipe if you go to speakpipe.com slash thepursuitzone. And now, let me introduce my guest. Larry Mishkar backpacked 400 miles across Iceland over 25 days. He traveled from the southern shore to the northern coast on the volcano route. And today, he will share with you why Iceland might be the best place for your first international backpacking trip. You can learn more about Larry at his website, LarryMishkar.com. Larry Mishkar, welcome to the Pursuit Zone. Hey, thank you, Paul. Good to be here. Larry, what first got you interested in backpacking? As a young child, we had a cottage in northern Wisconsin. And so every weekend from you know, April through October, uh, we were at the cottage and we were outside in the woods. And then in the wintertime, you know, we were ice fishing, but we were once again outside in the woods. And it's just kind of a natural progression uh, into spending more time there and then, you know, overnights and, you know, getting closer to nature. And uh, was Iceland your first kind of international big backpacking trip? Uh, yes, Iceland was the, the first big backpack trip. Uh, my hiking partner and I were living in Seattle, and we were spending a lot of time uh, in the Pacific Northwest hiking and backpacking. I had been traveling to uh, the Nordic countries for a bit on work and realized that Iceland might be a great place to hike. We did some research uh, through Google and discovered that, yeah, we should put Iceland on our our trip list. And that's what, that's how we got there. Well, what was it about Iceland? Do you recall that specifically that drew you to it? They have a hiking mentality. They hike, they love to go for hikes, short hikes, long hikes. Uh, They have excellent uh, hiking routes. There are huts scattered around the country. Uh, it, It seemed really accessible. And once we started poking around on the internet and we found a blog from a couple of guys who had hiked across the country. Uh, It seemed very doable. While there were uh, some unknowns, I think there were a lot more knowns, a lot more things like, oh, this is understandable. Uh, uh, It's a short airplane ride. It's just a well-oiled system for for backpacking. And it's part of their culture. So we thought it would be the the best one to go for. How much research would you say that you did before you went? We did quite a few hours of research. we, we found one blog in particular that was well done as far as giving us the information we needed. It did leave us with too many questions, but it did help us find, say, for instance, uh, the website, uh, the company that sells the maps. So once we decided on Iceland and felt pretty confident in it, then we went out and got the maps and then went back and forth between the blog and the maps, making our route. But having those paper maps in hand really, that kind of sealed the deal as well. Where did you get the paper maps? There was a, there's a website. In fact, uh, it's still out there. I, uh, before I made my presentation at the uh, expo at Midwest Mountaineering in Minneapolis, uh, I double checked all my sources and there's a, a map site uh, that sells Icelandic maps. Uh, it's very easy to find. If you type in uh, Icelandic, you know, maps of Iceland, um, it'll come right up. Um, and then they ship uh, worldwide. Okay. So one of the decisions that you have to make is to decide you know, which of the different routes that you want to hike. Um, I guess I have a few questions here. One is kind of how many options are there or how many different routes? How did you choose the volcano route? And are there options for shorter routes like week-long hikes? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, There are many routes in Iceland. There are routes uh, closer to Reykjavik, the capital, and then there are routes all the way across the country uh, we chose this route, I think, uh, this was a few years ago, so I'm tapping back into the memory, but we chose this route because uh, we could take a bus to the trailhead, and then at the end of the route, in the northeast of Iceland, there's also a, a little bus that makes uh, 
connects some of the little villages up there. And so we were able to hike from, you know, from bus ride to bus ride. And then in the middle, uh, there were hut systems that had road access. So if there was ever a need to bail out, you know, due to uh, injury or illness, those transportation systems were there. And so we, we decided to go that route. Also that route, the uh, volcano route offered us a lot of different kind of scenery. I know Iceland is perhaps thought of, you know, as fire and ice, which there is plenty of, but the landscape does change. And there are trees in Iceland in, in some of the national parks. Uh, so it offered us, I think, a really good overview. Um, and uh, the distance was well within our realm of, of, of ability. Um, as far as shorter routes go, uh, if one rents a car, there are much smaller hikes you can do either on your own or with the groups that uh, take people hiking in Iceland. So you could hike just north of the capital. You can hike some of the beaches. And then part of our route is broken into also shorter routes that you can go between hut to hut. So a bus will take you to the lodge. You can hike uh, a couple of days over the mountains and then get back on another bus and go back to the capital. So like I said, it's a, it's a well-oiled uh, hiking culture in Iceland. And uh, you know we, we were able to take advantage of that. Tell me more about these buses. How do you find out the schedules of them? Is there any type of an app that helps you? Well, I'm not sure about an app because this was nearly seven and a half years ago. They do also run uh, their, some of their systems on old school. So the bus terminal is right downtown Reykjavik, and it connects to the buses at the airport. So say when one comes into Iceland and you want to go to Reykjavik, you, you get on the bus going downtown which is clearly marked, and then that takes you to the main bus terminal. Uh, the buses also act as kind of package delivery services. So when you get down to the terminal in, in downtown, uh, you can put you know your food packages on those buses, um, and then the schedules are they're very helpful. Uh, and the schedules are you know they start off in the morning and they'll make their way around. Uh, they stop at the gas stations, which serve as the bus stops, and so you pick up people and you you know leave packages you know off. Uh, and then, then they were able to do the same for us where we needed a food drop. The, the bus would come in, folks would get off the bus, and then our, our box would get off the bus too, and they would be you know, held in a special little area uh, for us to pick up later. So it's, it's, um, it's a good system. What kind of a budget would you estimate people would need for a trip like yours? Well, the most expensive part of this trip was the airline ticket. We flew Iceland Air because they have, it's just a nice airline to fly. And that's going to be the most expensive. And I've had tickets anywhere from 400 to a thousand dollars, depending on where I'm going. You know, if I'm leaving Portland or if I'm leaving Minneapolis, you know, food is expensive, much more there than here. It depends on what you eat. Uh, if you're a meat eater, if you're a vegetarian, uh, what kind of entertainment you need. Uh, we did not spend a whole lot of money. Uh, we, half of our food that we ate while we were packing, we, we brought with us. And then the, the fresh food, the fresher foods we bought there. So we had budgeted for that, but also we stayed at hostels. So by staying at a hostel, that kind of lessened our budget for, for how much money we needed in order to buy you know the local food there. Um, as far as the dollar amount, I, I really can't tell you. A lot of that would depend on you know personal choice as far as what you need and how much. But our meals were really basic. They kind of repeated often, but that was just out of simplicity's sake. What about carrying cash around the island with you? What do you recommend? Today's rates, a thousand crowns is about ten dollars. Um, I know we had cash with us. The buses, the hot systems, they a lot of them took uh, credit cards. Uh, you know, it was kind of swipe and go. I think we had, let's see, probably, probably the equivalent of uh, five hundred dollars in cash. Um, I, I, I'm pretty sure we didn't use it all just because it was so much easier just to use a credit card. Larry, what's the best time to go? We went um, mid-June to mid-July. We decided on that, I believe, because of our schedules. Uh, but we also had our eye on E15, that uh, big volcano that was causing quite a lot of disruption with air travel. So uh, we got into Iceland a day or two be after it stopped erupting. The trails were all open. We had no problem with closed trails. I guess some years they'll have big blizzards in June and July um, that will dump a lot of snow in certain areas. But we found that time to be good as far as temperature, what we were used to. It wasn't hot, although it doesn't really get hot there as we know hot. 
But yeah, we found that temperature to be nice, especially carrying backpacks for that kind of distance. We had a couple days of sleet, but we had, you know, some sun, lots of fog, you know, but, but no severe weather that would have kept us in our tent. Is it possible to go year round? Uh, year round trips. From what I've been told, winter time can be very brutal in the mountains. You know, it is an island out in the middle of the North Atlantic. So the weather can be really bad. Uh, there are folks who are doing some skiing later. I think it's like April, May. They are skiing across the center uh, of Iceland when it's much nicer out. And I know uh, July and August are pretty popular times there for, for backpacking as well. Yeah, I'd, with the changing weather, I'd be curious to how that's going to affect you know, opening up the, the season all year. What do people need to know about this holiday? You mentioned it in your presentation, 17th of June. Right. The 17th of June is the national holiday in Iceland. And uh, we we were not paying attention to uh, uh, regional uh, holidays. And so when we got there, we, we had to hurry up uh, and buy everything we needed on the 16th because everything was closed on the 17th. And then we departed on the 18th. And that's just one of those things to remember. Where are you going? Look at the national holidays. Look at any kind of special dates on the calendars. Um, you know, uh, we just kind of we landed there and thought, you know, all oh, business as usual. It, it just forced us to do a little our shopping much quicker than we thought. Oh, and we could have, uh, you know, delayed our departure into the into the mountains by a day. But it was just like, oh yeah, there, everything's closed here. Uh, in the U.S., many times we'll have national holidays, but that is a time of uh, purchasing. You know, and you celebrate July Fourth or. Uh, Labor Day by buying stuff. Um, and in other parts of the world on holidays, uh, you celebrate the holiday not by buying things, but by not buying things. Uh, so it was just, it was just uh, something that we uh, had to remember. Interesting concept. But yeah. And, uh, that, and that's why we travel, right? Because we, we want our mind expanded and we want to learn and, and, and see how other folks you know live. So yeah, it was a good reminder. I know Iceland's been a hot travel destination for quite a while how many other people can people expect to see you know out on the trail on their trip since we've been there iceland and tourism has um exploded uh there's a lot more hostels a lot more hotels places to stay Um, a lot of people are going to iceland as far as what they're doing i don't know how many people are backpacking And then I don't know how many people are backpacking, you know, which section of trail. The southern end of our trail, uh, I was told, receives about 10,000 visitors a year. And once again, there's two huts. And in between those two huts, it's a very nice trail, very nice hut system. Um, And they get a lot of visitors there because you can get off the bus, hike for a couple days, get on the bus and go back. The southern tip of the trail is a bit more rugged. And then anything uh, north from the last major hut that's uh, accessible on our, with a bus, uh, it's much quieter. We would see one or two hikers. We saw a lot more sheep than hikers. And then once we got into the north, there were more hikers uh, based around some of the campgrounds. But then once you got you know, away from the small villages, you were on your own. So we, we saw very few people once we were out of the what, what you could call the more populated hiking routes. Uh, but still, there, there weren't a whole lot of people out there. So you have maps that you mentioned. What about um, compass, GPS? Were you using any other type of navigational aid? Right. We had the, a couple of paper maps. And then uh, I had put in the route on an old iPhone. So we had a, a Google Earth of the route. Because of how well they have their trails marked, we really, I think we pulled out the phone just a couple of times to like get a bearing. Um, most of the time uh, with the maps and we had a route highlighted, you could, you know, take your map and your compass and you could see, you know, two mountains off in the distance, uh, a day or two day hike away. And you would just aim for that. There is a lot of geography that helps you. Um, there are, you know, there are mountain ranges and then there's a pass. Uh, well, you're going to hike through the pass. There are other things like giant rivers and waterfalls that are going to direct you in a left and right. So going there, you remember like, hey, we're on an island, <laughs> so we can't get lost, you know, and you have a good idea where the sun is, and then you use geography. As far as the hiking goes, the specifics, they have really nice trails, you know, they're, they're boot trails, and then there's lots of markers. So if you're in the mountains, you're going to have like 
two meter high bright yellow hiking stakes uh, to guide you in, in places where there might be snow or, or dense fog. And then a lot of the other trail markers are either small cairns uh, or uh, little green or red, you know, stakes in the ground marking the way. Um, but, you know, you have this, you know, two foot wide boot tread in front of you, to, you know, to follow. Um, and then there's also signage. So if you get to a place where the, the trail goes two or three different ways, there's, you know, signage. So you, you do need to know the names of either huts or villages uh, down your route so you can, you know, make the correct left or right hand turn. But, um, you know, it's, it's a well-oiled hiking system. And then a lot of places you 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 know where you're going to. You don't even really need a trail. The ground in some places, it's it's very compact. It's like a compacted gravel pit. So you can just hike for days and days. And then you'll just, you know, rejoin the trail. Other places, because of how the glaciers are continually running at, at a high rate, um, the old trails, some of the old trails, you can no longer cross the rivers in the morning when the you know glacier runoff would be less and the the lower the rivers would be lower. So sometimes now you have to go on the road, find the road, take the bridge over the the glacier river, and then get back on the trail. So um, some of that has changed, but those are things that once you figure out a route, you need to you know consult with a hiking group or or poke around a little bit online. You have to be aware that the environment and climate have changed a couple things here. What kind of shape does somebody need to be in to do a hike across Iceland? Well, I would I would always suggest to be in the best shape you can. You know, a, a good amount of the hike is fairly flat. It's just you know you're just putting in miles, miles and miles and miles. Other aspects, you know, there there are some steep ups and downs, and then there's some steep ups that you know plateau and then go up and plateau and. I remember for training for this trip, there's a great staircase in Ballard in the Seattle area that goes from the top of the cliff all the way down to this beach. And I was one of a few people with loaded backpacks going up and down those stairs every day, you know, for an hour or two or three. And then, you know, just using a weighted backpack to get in shape. And that that would I would highly recommend because, you know, you're out by yourself and you need to do everything you can before you go on this trip to make sure that you're going to be healthy and safe. Um, my, my personal mantra is the last thing I want to do is, you know, have someone endanger their lives to come rescue me uh, if there's something I could have done so I wouldn't have to be rescued. And, and getting in shape is, is one of those things. But, yeah, I would say spend, you know, uh, depending on where you are right now with your uh, physical health, I would say, you know, weight that backpack and, and start that training. Um, use hiking sticks, too. But, you know, definitely make sure you're in good physical shape to, to, to go there. Did you use trekking poles on this trip? Uh, we did use trekking poles. I've got some, um, in fact, I still have them. Uh, I've got some black diamond trekking poles. They were um, three-piece. They were pretty compact uh, when we weren't using them. And then we were able to put those in our backpacks in the luggage. Uh, they were short enough to go in the backpacks. But, yes, we did use those. Some of it was for stability. Also, you know, some of the terrain was rough, so we wanted those as well. And then, of course, if you do have some you know, serious problem, they, they make pretty good splints. So uh, they did serve a double purpose, but we made sure we had comfortable ones that were small enough to go in the packs and that also you know, could be used in case of an emergency. And you carried your packs in the overhead compartments of the plane? No, this was all checked. These were, okay. uh, yeah, this was um, you know, the, a bigger backpack. The, the only the, when we got on the plane, uh, our carry on was, I think, a computer, uh, a camera, and then just, you know, it was like a little day pack. So we, we put everything we could in into the check bag. And did you carry your day pack with you? No. Uh, what we did is, like I said in, in the beginning, we were pretty minimal on this trip. So we had, you know, a set of clean clothes and um, some personal items. So we put those in the day pack and then we found a hostel right in downtown Reykjavik that had lockers. It was really set up for, for backpackers, for trekkers. And so we, we left our one day pack with them in a locked uh, locker there. So when we came back from our trek, we just went there and the hostel was open 24 hours a day. So we could pick up that day pack and then, you know, change into some, some clean things. Tell me a little bit about how you outfitted yourself, um, your backpack, your, what kind of boots, are you wearing boots or you wearing shoes? Um, that sort of thing. We took very little with us. One reason being that you don't need much. I mean, it's it's kind of like wash and repeat. You get up and you go for a hike and then you know, 
every day you keep doing the same activity. And, you know, through our research and looking at temperature, we were able to figure out what we would need for clothing. So as far as, you know, gear went, we had a tent, two sleeping pads, two 15 degree bags, sleeping bags. And then we, we'd use one of our, our, our puffies as a pillow. So the, our sleeping system was simple. Uh, the tent was bomb proof. We took a Hilleberg two person tent uh, because, you know, we had heard of high winds you know, that would go on and on. That was a possibility and also heavy snow. So we wanted a tent that would work well. As far as footwear, some folks go across Iceland in running shoes and we did see some of that. We we went older school. We had some high top leather, heavy duty hiking boots. And we did that specifically because of the ash. You know, there was a lot of ash on the trail in the south. And we wanted to keep that ash out of our footwear. So the, the taller hiking boot uh, really, really helped. And then we had three-quarter shorts, length shorts on. We used a lot of merino wool because we, we weren't going to have a place to, to wash uh, you know, uh, synthetic clothes to, uh, to keep them you know, smelling somewhat fresh. So we went with a merino wool. And then, you know, of course, a basic layering system, which was you know, a thin top, uh, a puffy, uh, a wind rain shell, uh, a warmer hat, a baseball hat, thin gloves thicker gloves so it was, it was just a real simple basic layering system that you know we could combine so we'd be comfortable and most of the time we we trekked in just like a long sleeve wool shirt and then our pants uh we really didn't need much else at night uh it did get cooler uh, so it was puffy weather but after hiking all day uh we were in our tent eating and then you know it was kind of lights out <laughs> there there wasn't a whole lot of hanging around time once once we uh, got our camp up uh also there are little crafters huts all over iceland and these are huts where folks will sell things that they make and one of the things they make a lot of in iceland are wool sweaters so about halfway through our hike we stopped in a crafters hut and each of us got a wool sweater a hand knit wool sweater and that wool sweater was warmer than our puffies. However, combined, we had a really good layering system. So even though we were out of any kind of city, uh, there were there were still clothes. We could still buy clothing, things to keep us warm. And we did that. It was nice to you know come home with something handmade from Iceland as well. How is that? Uh, the wool in that sweater, is it itchy? It's not merino wool. Um, however, it's not the old school itchy that, you know, that I knew of from years ago. Yeah. And then we had it over something else. So, um, it, it's not that big of an issue. I still have the sweater. In fact, it's like about a meter behind me in a bag. But no, it's it's not the old school itchy. It's 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 quite nice. So you were, I think, sleeping in your tent every night. Um, but there is the option to do the huts. Um, can you speak a little bit about the huts and how you go about getting a a spot in one? Yeah, we spent one night in a hut. I believe it was just a, let's just try it out. Uh, there was plenty of space and we had, I had never done a hut and I don't think my hiking, hiking partner had either. So, uh, yeah, we just decided, decided to do that. We walked up to the hut, checked in, went to the front desk. Uh, they have a warden, what they call, who they call a warden there. And, uh, we got a room. It was, you know, fairly simple. Uh, and the room ended up being, you know, a large room with just two very long bunk beds. And then you just put your stuff in a spot and, and that was it. It's very simple. Some of the huts have hot showers. I don't know the U.S. dollar amount, but I know the hot shower was 400 kroners, 400 crowns. And for camping, they really prefer that you don't wild camp. A lot of folks don't know, leave no trace. So we, we did wild camp a couple of times, but we made sure we were camping on ground and not, you know, lichen or moss. But I, I just found the receipt for the camping and camping at a hostel or a hut outside was $10 a person, which is very reasonable. And you also have access to bathrooms, and they have both flush toilets and um, an outhouse situation. But it's really nice, you know, and folks are standing there in the morning with running water, brushing their teeth. Some of the huts have uh, full kitchens with all the utensils that you could use. So um, yeah, some of the huts are pretty posh for being where they are, and a lot of it depends on uh, if there's road access to that hut or not. What do you do for water? Do you need to bring a water filter? How do you find water? For the most part, water is everywhere. Uh, and, and I say that because sometimes you're looking at the water and you can't get to it because it's down in a canyon and you're not in the canyon, but there's water everywhere. One of the selling points of, of Iceland, I remember seeing these billboards and it said something like, you can drink our water. <laughs> and there's a real big selling point that as long as you're not around uh, where the sheep are, you can drink water off the surface. 
And we did. And you know, it's that pure. It's coming off the glaciers. We would camel up when we got to a water source. A lot of times it was a, a glacier runoff, super cold, super tasty water. And then we would drink and drink. We would never carry water over water or to water. So we would you know, time our water. So we would kind of be running out when we got to another source. And the maps we use show all the water, uh, the rivers, creeks, glaciers, et cetera. So we knew where the water was located. I don't think we ever used uh, iodine tabs, nor did we pump. I think uh, if we were concerned, I think we boiled it. But for the most part, we just drank. We just stuck our cup in the in the in the water and drank from it. So, that, which was really nice not ha- not to have to worry about that. Where are you finding? I'm guessing you're cooking your food, but you can't bring gas over. Um, on the airplane. So how do you get supplied with the fuel that you need? There's two ways to get fuel. The first way is just to go to a gear store. Um, Reykjavik has at least one uh, awesome gear store that I know of, and and there's probably more there since we were there. So you just go to a gear store and uh, you get the cans of gas. There are two kinds of gas that they use. They come in similar looking cans, so you have to make sure you get the right kind. Uh, that was my experience. The second way to get fuel which we found out about later in our trip is when when folks get done with the trip, uh, they typically have extra gas and no one's going to take it home. So at many of the huts, there is a what we would call in Olympia, Washington, a free box. And there's a box somewhere around the hut that says free. And there's sometimes clothing in there, sometimes food, but many times cans of gas. So if you're willing to, you know, shake a few cans of gas, you can get your gas for free. So while you can't, you know, rely on that as always being there, uh, it is an option. So if you take a can of gas with you and you get to a hut, there's, you know, a dozen cans still there. You know, you take a can or two and you know use it up and then recycle it. So, uh, but we discovered the the free boxes about halfway into our, our truck, and that was really helpful. Uh, it, it was kind of a peace of mind that if we did run out, if something did happen, that there there were uh, there were options. What types of dangers? do people need to be aware of on these trails? Well, they don't have animals to be afraid of. There is a fox, but if you see a fox, you're usually pretty excited because it's probably, besides birds, the, the only other uh, animal that you'll see. Dangers could be uh, steam uh, and hot water. You know, some of the trails go near this, and if you weren't careful, you could you know burn yourself. You could fall. You could trip. Uh, so more, more of it's just the general hiking Nothing um, associated with Iceland per se, but it's more of just a general hiking, accident, tripping, falling, cutting yourself. There is obsidian, that very sharp rock in Iceland. And if you don't know what you're grabbing onto, you know, you could slice your hand on that. But yeah, other than that. um, Well, Larry, you you were there right during this E15 eruption. And I mean, how did that change the hike for you? And what I remember in your presentation, you talked about eye drops and uh, 3M you know, masks for breathing and so on. It was kind of touch and go. I, I guess we gambled a little bit and said, we're going to do this. And E15 uh, stopped erupting right before we got there. But we did prepare for ash in our lungs and in our eyes. So a friend of mine who's a volcanologist suggested a very specific uh, 3M product mask, which we took two of. And then we also took uh the best, I guess you could say, eye drops that we could find over the counter in case of ash storms. And they have ash storms from time to time, but uh, there's so much fresh ash on the ground that this was more of a concern. So uh, I think we used the masks once, maybe. Um, And of course, they're super lightweight. So it was uh, taking something that weighed nothing, but that could really help us in a jam. Um, And then when we didn't, we got out of the ash zone, the people hiking, we met some people hiking south, we gave our masks to them because they were walking right into the ash storm and that ashy area. Um, the eye drops did come in handy. We had a, a French hiking partner for a while and she had gotten some uh, ash in her eyes. Um, we had this little system set up that if the wind blew and the ash started flying, you would just yell ash and then everyone would put their heads down and put their hands over their eyes. So that, that helped us avoid some injury or potential damage, but uh, we did have to use like a half a bottle of drops to get the ash out of her eyes, uh, but then everything was fine. So we, we did take those two items with us, and, you know, it was nice having them there because uh, a lot of times we'd be hiking and we'd look behind us, and it was a whiteout of ash. 
uh, you know, a couple hours from where we were hiking uh, to the south. Um, so maybe by you know chance and luck, we missed some of the big ash storms. But that was only in the southern southern area where we had that concern. So what do you see out there when you're hiking? How how does the landscape change as you're going from south to north? I've always been intrigued by the Arctic landscape. I, I think sometimes there's an opinion that, well, there's really nothing there, but there's so much there. And so my mind, my eyes train to the Arctic landscape. So you have a lot of tiny flowers. There is bird life. There's hot, sulfury ground. There's stinky air, which, of course, you can't see, but, oh, you can smell it. Uh, the rock formations, a lot of different rocks. There are trees in a place called Thorismork, Thor's Woods. You start walking into this area, and it's uh, shrubs, I think willow, and other flowering uh, plants. And it just it smells like you're in a perfume department. It's incredible. And then as you get to the north, there's a, a planted forest in this one national park. So, so it, it, it does change. Um, you know, there are stretches of the same kind of landscape, but there's also like degrees of change, like in the high uh, central area, you know, like I said before, it's, it's like a, a, a gravel pit that's been smoothed down, but then there's these bright green volcano cones where all the moss is growing. And then on the inside, it's this red rock that had once been super hot. So some areas are, are much more subtle as far as what you'll see of course color and then other areas especially the areas that are still hot uh still smoking and still steaming um you know the colors are incredible uh as as far as what you're seeing so uh, you have to we did a lot of reading before we went so we had not expectations but we kind of we knew what we might see and so it kind of opened our eyes to to a different landscape and to appreciate it because of what uh, what's been happening on this island for so many years what did you find the to be the most challenging part of the trip? I remember hiking up a very steep trail section and I kept shouting out, whose idea was this? And then the answer would come up from up higher. This is your idea. Like, oh, okay. So even though I had trained a lot, uh, um, hiking and hiking these switchbacks, um, you know, for a flatlander from uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota was, um, it wasn't hard, but they just kept on going, kept on going. And then once you got to the top, you're like, wow, this is gorgeous. <laughs> so there was this appreciation of uh, work hard and then you're, you're rewarded for that hard work. And then learning and, and figuring this out that the harder you worked to get somewhere, uh, the landscape rewarded you, if, if that's fair. What do you remember as being the most memorable parts? Well, one of the most memorable parts is the three of us having lunch in an outhouse in, in the north of Iceland because the, the the wind was so strong. It was blowing us in our backpacks. Uh, it was like a horizontal wind up, you know, 50 miles an hour plus. And then we also had sleet and rain coming horizontally. So we ended up having lunch in this outhouse in a national park, the three of us. So I, I remember that because it's like, oh, I've read about people doing this, you know, like the weather's so bad they end up crashing somewhere bizarre. And then a day before that, I think I was swimming in a glacier pond, you know, like au naturel. I was like, wow, look, water, and it's not going to kill us. And it's warm, relatively speaking, because it was being heated by the earth. And so I'm just out there swimming in this pond. And the next day I'm be having lunch in an outhouse because we needed to get out of the rain. So, um, yeah, th- those two things stick out in my mind. Yeah, food and outhouses aren't supposed to go together. Not in the way we put them, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but it was, it was, it was like here we are, and we're we're kind of wet, and we're kind of cold, and we were super hungry, and oh look, there's a shelter. <laughs> so, uh, well, yeah. How, and, what size was this shelter? Well, it was large enough for three people to s- stand. So I would say it's a two meter square, and a concrete floor. Yeah, it was a one holer. <laughs> yeah, I remember that it was a one holer and you know we put the seat down and I think someone sat on, on there and then the rest of us and there was really nowhere to put food out and cut it so we're like holding things and cutting things in our hands and and such but uh, you know it was warm <laughs> and dry so and uh, yeah one of our hiking mates was, was from France and so she was quite amused this was her first international trip ever yeah, she's quite amused to have lunch in a vase, she said. 
So, Larry, what happened to you after the trip? Uh, you alluded to something when we were talking before the interview started about no more cubicle job after this. What happened? Well, you know, that's absolutely true. Uh, looking back, this was one of those, you know, um, life-changing trips, I guess you could say. I had been, you know, spending a lot of time outside there ever since I was a kid. Uh, but this trip was, uh, I had a, a lovely job in Seattle with lovely people doing archaeology work. And uh, it was very nice. I really liked it. I liked everything about it. But, you know, sitting in my office, the one window, I could see Mount Rainier out of one window. And then if I went to someone else's office, I could see, you know, the Olympic Peninsula, <laughs> the other direction. And so sometimes it was very hard to stare at a, at a computer screen with Rainier, like looking over my shoulder. And so going to Iceland and being outside, and I, I wouldn't say I, I proved anything to myself, but I, I became aware of the fact that, oh, I can do this, and this really fits uh, my personality. It fits how I like to be. So that was like, okay, I think I'm done with cubicle work. I think I'm done with that whole inside, you know, staring at screens as much as I do. I mean, the computer is so much a part of our life. Uh, these days, you know, communication, banking, etc. So there, there is some screen staring that probably has to happen. But that was that was the big life uh, life changing event for me. It was like, yeah, yeah, this is this is what I like. I like, you know, having thirty two pounds on my back with all my stuff. And this is what I wear, and these are the experiences. Um, but it's it's not just the travel part, but it's going to different countries, different parts of the globe, and then returning with knowledge, ideas, humility, thoughts, language, and then incorporating that not only into your personal life, but also into the life of whatever community or communities you're a part of. So, you know, you, you for me, I love to cook. And so I, I was bringing back recipes and <clears throat> different ways to, you know, handle ingredients, uh, different ways to think about food, um, different ways to think about living too. So the, the travel part isn't just to check a box and say, okay, I've been here, I've been here, I've been here, because I can afford to, but to go places and then come back and, you know, kind of spread the gospel or just be aware of it and then, you know, make that part of your life. So I'm curious about what, after you quit your job, then what did you do? How do you, um, how did you organize yourself and set yourself up so that you can have a little, this, a little more freedom to travel, but still, you know, have some money coming in? Ah, uh, the big question. I've, I've been asked this question a bunch, and it, there's there's multiple ways um, to answer it. So not having a full-time job, I w became a consultant, which means um, you can kind of pick and choose which work you do and when. I, I and When I was living in Ballard, I had a housemate who was a carpenter, and so when the construction project was over, he'd go climbing. And then, you know, when he's done climbing, he'd come back and get another job and work that job, save money, and then go climbing. So I looked around me, especially in Seattle, and to see how folks were doing things, uh, making it work. And one of the things I noticed is if you don't buy stuff, you don't need to work as much. If you look around, we're, you know, we're constantly told, you know, to go shopping just to go shopping, like a form of entertainment, to buy stuff just to buy. And there was a lot of questioning uh, for me of like, well, do I need it? And when you when you put the word need into the equation, then suddenly there's no really reason to go shopping at, at the rate that we do. So I took what I had, the excess, and uh, went on eBay and got rid of lots of stuff or just put the free box outside on the street in Ballard and then discovered that when I you don't buy stuff you don't need, uh, you have a lot more money, but you also have a lot more free time to go do things that are important to you. So I, I became maybe the country's oldest uh, organic farm intern for a summer uh, to pick up skills on, you know, working with animals and plants and, and selling, you know, vegetables. And then I started working for Outward Bound uh, as a seasonal cook, contributing and giving back. Um, I, I just didn't want to be someone who just traveled and, you know, tagged mountains, but I wanted to give back to society, you know, give back uh, more than I take to serve, to do service work as well. Uh, so I was, I was trying to find a balance between service work, free time to explore, to grow, and to play, the idea of playing. And then, you know, of course, I have to make some money you know, to pay for bills. But uh, as long as I didn't buy stuff, I didn't have to make as much money. Um, and then I didn't have to work as much. Yeah, so it was, uh, 
days on the trail like that, we were unplugged um, and there was conversation and then there was a lot of quiet time. And the quiet time is great for thinking because when you don't have inputs, then your brain can process and spit stuff out. And it was spitting out things like, you know, this seems to be the life you like. You know, this really fits you. And I could hear it. I was able to hear what was happening. You mentioned that Iceland was your first international trip. How many years ago was it? Was it seven years ago? Right. It was the summer of 2010. So yeah, it'll just, it's creeping up on eight years, Paul. <laughs> and so since then, since you've kind of had this lifestyle change, so to speak, you know, what, what other destinations have you been to? One of the places that I go to, or the Nordic countries are a place uh, that I go to. Uh, a couple of years ago, I did a, a short hike through Finland. Finland also has uh, a fantastic hiking trails, walking trails. And a lot of times what they'll do is if each village has a series of walking trails, they'll just tie them all together. So I, I took off with a small backpack uh, one day north of Helsinki and, and hiked one of the national park hiking trails there solo, which was fantastic. There are a lot of Finns out in the woods. Uh, <laughs> And once again, it's a country where, you know, being outside is, is, is part of their culture. So I think I may have met more people in Finland out hiking than I did crossing Iceland. And then also a couple of years ago, a friend of mine, we went in a, a late seasonal hike into the Norwegian mountains uh, west of Oslo. And we took the train to the mountains at Finsa, got off the train and then hiked for what, four or five days uh, through the mountains. And that was kind of snowy and icy, all kinds of weather. Uh, but, you know, once again, that was one of those trips using public transportation, just like I did in Finland. You take a bus, you take a train, you get dropped off and you hike, and then you get back on public transportation and go back. So those are the things that I've, I've done since Iceland. And it just it keeps going. Um, I've done hikes here. I've done the spear hiking trail solo in pieces, kind of as a way to, you know, just get away for a month or so as well. So then there's, you know, there's, there's thinking of more trips coming up in the future, but, uh, we'll see what happens. Is there anything that's going to take you back to Iceland? Uh, yes, I, I would love to do the Iceland hike again, especially as a comparison trip, um, you know, with more hikers and, and to see what kind of wear and tear the trails are in, what the system looks like. I would like to do the South to North again. And then I'd love to do uh, like East to West, the longer version of that. Now that I have a good understanding of the transportation systems and buses uh, to get in place, um, the the West Fjords are just gorgeous. I, I think the whole country is gorgeous, but I'd like to do kind of the crisscross, um, and then you know do some kind of winter ski trip in Iceland would be fabulous too. So you know there there are things there are trips in my mind going around in circles. So at some point they'll happen. Have you ever done the Wonderland Trail? Uh, I've done sections of it. Around Rainier, I've done, yeah, I've done sections of the southern part and then part of the north, but not in its entirety. I just learned about that a couple of years ago. It looks pretty amazing. What's your experience there? It is amazing. Um, I think, what is it, 96 miles, I believe. The sections that we did were, you know, well above tree line uh, in the northeast part. And then some of it's very steep, but it's gorgeous. And, you know, Rainier National Park is, is one of my favorite parks just because of what you can see, uh, the variety. Um, I, I felt very humbled when I lived in the Pacific North, Northwest and I would go on hikes, a lot of solo trips, and I would see rocks and trees that have been around way before I was here, especially the trees. And they're still there, and they're, they're going to be around long after I'm gone. The humility of knowing that and just stopping and looking and saying, you know, I really don't matter. <laughs> I'm just a blip. And these trees, uh, yeah, it was it was pretty incredible. So, you know, it's, at some point, the Wonderland Trail would be nice. Uh, I do have an affinity for traveling or hiking overseas. And that comes from the fact that many of these Nordic countries have something that they call every man's right, which is this, you know, freedom to roam, freedom to hike, freedom to camp, build a fire, pick berries on land. Uh, they don't have the trespass laws that we do here. Uh, there's obvious places you can't camp like in someone's yard uh an active pasture you know there's certain areas but you have the x you have the legal ability to be in places that you don't hear and that kind of freedom the freedom to roam for me is really important where if i see a beautiful site uh and i'm in finland or norway you can you can walk there you can go there you can pitch your tent and that you you can't always do that here you have to be in a in a restricted area like a park or a, or a certain, you know, a forest, national forest, state forest. So uh, I am attracted to this openness that they have. 
for access. Yeah, I think Scotland has that too. Have you thought about Scotland? Um, I have. I was in Scotland. Scotland was my first international trip in 1987, my first trip out of the U.S., and I, I landed in Presswick, Scotland. Yeah, that's kind of where this whole seed for, for international travel started. Um, but yeah, we were able to hike anywhere there as well. I didn't know what I was doing there. Um, and I, what I mean by that is like, here I am first time. I, I, I didn't understand what, what was possible. We stayed at bed and breakfast and we ate at pubs and we did day hikes, but it wasn't the extreme of, you know, let's put on a backpack and, and go for a long time. I appreciate the, the those, uh, those countries that have these kinds of, of rights. And I also, you know, work hard to respect it. So I'm not someone who might possibly help eliminate those kinds of rights by, you know, you know, bad camping practices or other things. So uh, that's a huge responsibility when a country says, yeah, you can hike or camp anywhere. Uh, when we were in Finland, I had the map out because I, I wasn't sure where to go. I mean, I was an American and the map said, take a right. And I'm like, this isn't someone's driveway. And then the map said, keep hiking straight toward those woods. And it's like, that's, I'm hiking next to someone's house. I'm hiking past their barn. And so I, I was slightly nervous. So I, I kept the map out in my hand. So they knew I was a hiker. Like, you know, look, look, I'm just following the map. Please don't yell. And that was this whole, you know, American hiking experience. And as I'm hiking by it, there's, there's a little sign tacked up on to the farmhouse of, for the hiking trail to recognize the fact that, yes, you are on the trail and it goes right past our kitchen window. And then you go past the machine shed and you get by the barn and there's a fence and there's a little hiking sign on the fence post. You open up the fence, you go past the animals and the tractors, and there's a national hiking trail through this farmer's yard, right through his yard, between his Volvo and his farmhouse, there's a trail. So while I was nervous about doing that, I was overjoyed. Like, yes, isn't this great? This is fantastic. And it, it spoke to me like, yes, this is what I, this is what I like. Larry, how can people find you online? I am uh, on Facebook under Larry Mishkar. Uh, and I, I've helped a few people get to Iceland, uh, some coworkers, some folks here in Duluth, uh, some total strangers have sent me messages. So yeah, Facebook is a good way. Also my website, LarryMishkar.com. There's a contact page. People can, you know, send information that way. And like I said, you know, I can send you my PowerPoint of my presentation so you can watch it. Also, you know, help you with finding the map sites um, and then some logistics as well. I'm I'm very happy to help folks get to Iceland and have an experience that will probably, you know, help change their lives as well. So, and Mishkar is M I S H K A R. That is correct. Yes. Okay, Larry, thanks so much for coming on the show and telling your story. Appreciate it. Well, Paul, thank you for having me. And uh, hopefully some of the listeners will end up in uh, Iceland this year. I hope so. Thank you for listening. If you want to support the show, you can do so by subscribing to the show on Apple Podcasts or through iTunes. And you can like The Pursuit Zone on Facebook or follow along on Twitter at The Pursuit Zone. Recorded January 7, 2018. For the show notes and for more great adventure podcasts, visit thepursuitzone.com.